Hey super scientists, we're looking at evolution 3 and we're going to be talking about biological evolution. Take a look at these images here. These are all examples of trilobites. Can you see how they all look similar, but yet they all have striking differences? Some of them have antenna, some have elongated bodies, some have very pronounced lobes, the three lobe section that gives them the name trilobite. So they all look like these arthropods, but they have some differences and some similarities. Take a look at this picture. What do you see going on here? It's a very nice picture out in a field, right? But do you see this insect bug, this walking stick? It's pretty well camouflaged there, huh? So we're going to be looking at animal adaptations to start off with. So there are several adaptations that you may have talked about when you were in sixth grade even. Camouflage, the ability to blend in with its environment. This could be camouflage that is due to color, or it could be color and body structure, as we saw with the example of the walking stick bug. Defense mechanisms, being able to have sharp quills like porcupines or being able to sting. Feeding adaptations, the beak shape, the shape of teeth being very fast. So for example, the beaks like we've talked about with the finches and the Galapagos, the shape of teeth. Carnivores are going to have sharper pointed teeth, whereas with herbivores, you're going to have more flattened teeth to be able to grind the vegetation that they eat. And omnivores will have some combination of both. Movement. Animals may move in different ways. Some animals are going to be able to swim, like the penguins. Um, and penguins are birds, but they are able to swim. Their body is um, anatomically adapted to help them to do that. Whereas birds like pelicans, they're going to have larger wings, but they may have a beak shape that allows for them to be able to scoop up their food. So their movement, the wings, or whether they can move on four feet or walking on two feet like people, that's an adaptation. And mud skippers. These guys are really interesting. They're fish that can walk on land. You should look at some pictures of mud skippers. They're really interesting moving around, kind of using their flippers as their feet. Survival of the fittest is also called natural selection. And this is one thing that Charles Darwin observed in a statement that he developed. So this is based on organisms that are base, best suited for their environment, being the ones that are able to survive and the ones that are able to reproduce. And we talked about this example with the peppered moths. So the peppered moths are going to be um, really evident previously in the Industrial Revolution. And peppered moths have this white and black color, but during the Industrial Revolution, when there was a lot of soot covering trees and a lot of black exhaust being pumped out from factories, all that black smoke and, and soot fell everywhere and covered things like trees even. And so the peppered moths, the ones that had this really white, lighter coloration, no longer blended into the trees, they stood out a lot from the black background. And so they would be easy prey for predators like birds. So those peppered moths that had the wider coloration would not be the ones that survived. They would not be best suited to their environment. And so they would not be passing on their genetic material. Whereas the organisms that were peppered moths that were more black in color would be the ones that survived because they would be able to blend in with those trees and everything that was soot colored. There are some different factors that affect natural selection. One is organisms being able to produce and um, for having more offspring than is necessary. And one really neat example is spiders. And I'm not really a fan of spiders, but they sometimes can be kind of neat. So there are certain parts of the world where there's like a spider season and spiders are just hanging around everywhere in these massive webs. And that's because spiders produce more offspring than is necessary because not all of the little baby spiders are going to survive. Variations among a species. So this is an example showing us some bears. And all three of these bears are sort of a brown color, but they have some variation. And those variations help to have genetic diversity among the species. And the organisms that are going to survive are the ones that are going to be able to pass down their genetic information. They'll be able to pass down their DNA and reproduce. 
inheritance. So whenever you see inheritance, this is talking about genetics. It's talking about heredity and the DNA that you get from your parents. So variations are passed to offspring. And some of these variations are going to allow members to survive and reproduce better than others. So the example that I am showing you here is beetles. So in this previous earlier generation, we have some green beetles and some orange beetles, and apparently the green beetles are really yummy. And so the birds are picking off and eating the green beetles. And then they're going to have a bunch of orange beetles left over, right? So if the green beetles are all being eaten, then they're not able to reproduce. They're not able to pass that DNA on to their offspring because there will not be any offspring because they will have been eaten by the birds. So you're going to have a bunch more orange beetles. And then generations later, the birds will have eaten all of the yummy green beetles and all they're kind of left is the orange beetles, which apparently don't taste as good. So these kind of orange brown beetles are the ones that are going to be left over. And those are the ones who will have survived the predation from the birds. And so those orange beetles are the ones who were able to pass on their DNA so that their offspring survived and their offspring could produce more offspring. And so we end up with lots of orange beetles. So over time, the individuals that have the most beneficial traits, the ones that are most suited to the environment, are going to be the ones that survive and that will make up more of the population. So one trait that is something that you see a lot is color. And you may have heard of albinism, and you may have even seen one of these snakes. It's kind of yellowish Burmese python. So this little um, alligator here, he's able to survive. He blends in pretty well with his environment. But if you look at the one that's albino, the albinism um, lacks pigment. It lacks the melanin. And so the organism that is albino will end up having sort of a yellowish or creamy white color to it and that is not going to be conducive for the survival of the alligator. Same thing with the Burmese pythons here. So this Burmese python that's the, the regular natural coloration it allows it to blend in in sort of foresty areas and rainforest wooded areas whereas if it's an albino it's going to have this bright yellow color it's not going to blend in so well with a natural forest and so it's going to be very evident that a yellow snake is slithering around. So the beneficial traits like color are going to allow it to survive because it can find shelter and can hide from possible predators. Anatomy is one other thing that is very important in biological evolution. And one structure is um, called analogous structures. So these are structures that serve the same purpose in different species without them having a common ancestor. So remember, ancestor is going to be like the previous organisms of that species that lived long ago, even millions of years ago. So one example is wings. So birds have wings, butterflies have wings, bats have wings, but that doesn't necessarily mean all of those organisms were related once. So those are analogous structures because they did not have a common ancestor. Homologous structures, however, did have a common ancestor. So your stem homo means same. So that should be easy to remember this. Homologous structures having same ancestor. So these are characteristics that indicate that the organism had a common ancestor. And so one um, organism is cats. So Felidae. Um, so these are all examples of different types of cats. Saber-toothed tigers, uh, lions, cheetahs, little cute bobcat here. So all of these are examples of felines and they all look very cat-like. They act similar and pouncing. They have some sharp teeth to help them tear food. They have um, fur, thick fur, and so and they're all very lean and are um, able to pounce and run pretty quickly. So all of these are in the feline family and they all had common ancestors. So they look very similar. They have homologous structures. So evolution can occur in two different kind of ways. So gradualism is going to be a method that occurs gradually. It's a slow process. So it will take millions of years for this type of evolution to be evidenced. And in this case of horses, the modern day equine, equus, um, it took 40 million years for this to go from the Aohippus and Hyracotheriums um, and this four-toed 
horse that we've uh, looked at a couple of different examples and then three toes and then uh, starting to have a hoof here so this all took about 40 million years until we could see the modern day kind of structure of a horse punctuated equilibrium is another type and this is something that's going to happen more quickly and in this example species are going to um, branch off and they start evolving at the same time, but they're evolving differently. So we have the paleomastodon, which is like an ancient mammoth kind of organism, uh, Proboscidea, and then we have elephants that are kind of branching off here and the mammoths and elephants that we see today. But then we also had some kind of side branches on this family tree. So we have stegodons and mammoths and gomtheriums. We have a, a lot of different branches on this tree and they're branching off and evolving separately with different types of characteristics, but they all are sort of in the same family. Take a look at these skulls. Can you tell which one of these is a human skull? So all three of these skulls at the bottom, these are all three humans. These are um, just some different variation based on geography. So those are all three human skulls. So did humans come from monkeys? Well, this is one misunderstanding that a lot of people think of when they hear the word evolution. A lot of people get upset because they think that evolution means humans come from monkeys, and that's not the case. So what does evolution say about humans? It says that humans and apes ape-like creatures had a common ancestor over four million years ago. So this does not say that humans evolved from apes or monkeys or chimpanzees. It says that there was some common DNA over four million years ago. And one example is Artie, an Artipithecus rambidus. And so this is a skull. And you can look at all of these skulls and you can see that there are some um, hominids. These are all examples of hominids. So these are what we would refer to as cavemen. So all of these are examples of what we would call cavemen. And this is Homo sapiens sapiens, that is modern day humans. So you can see that there are similarities with these, but there are also differences because things have changed throughout time. And this is just um, a cladogram showing you a little bit better view of how some of those things branched out. So we have humans up here, and then we have some of our, our caveman um, organisms and then we have some other branches so this is an example showing us that um, that punctuated equilibrium where we have a lot of branches kind of coming off of the tree and humans homo sapiens are one of these branches and this is the homo sapiens right there this modern day humans